These are the last days because the Bible said in the last days or in the end of the age, Israel will be the center of the focus of the world. That sounds crazy. How can a, a, a nation the size of New Jersey be the center of the entire world? Why would the whole world focus on that? Well, it's true. Here it is again. It's showing the truth of the Word of God and the prophecies of Messiah's coming. God's promise to Abraham was unconditional. It did not depend on what Abraham and his descendants did or didn't do. God said, this covenant I will keep with you and believing Israel. In this season, it's so very important that we understand the prophetic significance of what we're seeing in our world, particularly as it pertains to Israel. And no one understands the connection between the Bible and the headlines of today better than my good friend, Rabbi Jonathan Kahn. This is Jonathan Kahn. And we are living in perilous times, dangerous times, dramatic times, prophetic times. What does it all mean? Israel is at war. All around the world, there are people chanting hate to Israel, destruction to Israel, hate to the Jewish people. What does it all mean? Number one, it means that the Bible is true. The Bible is the word of God. Because the Bible says that in the last days or the end of the age, Israel will be back in the world. God will gather the Jewish people from the ends of the earth and bring them back to the land of Israel. Well, he's done it. The fact that there is an Israel in the world that there can be all this trouble over, that's a sign. It has to be. God did it. You know, for so long, there were people who denied this would ever happen throughout the year. Even people in the church said it will never happen. Well, God said it would happen. It happened. The Bible is true. God is true. Secondly, what else does it mean? These are the last days because the Bible said in the last days or in the end of the age, Israel will be the center of the focus of the world. That sounds crazy. How can a, a, a nation the size of New Jersey be the center of the entire world. Why would the whole world focus on that? Well, it's true. Here it is again. It's showing the truth of the word of God and the prophecies of Messiah's coming. You see, it, it's crazy. There's almost no other, there's really no other news story. If you go back 10 years, 20 years, 30, 40, 50 years, what story was a news story then that's a news story now? It's, this, it's Israel. That's the only one. And it's all about the same issue. Ultimately, it's about the issue of Israel's existence. Number three, Israel's not just the center of the focus of the world, but the center of controversy. The Bible says it will be the center of controversy. Nations will try to move it, try to change the border. Nations will try, well, it'll be the center. And so it is again. So it, it always comes back. It might, might be a, a little lull for a little while, you know, that it's not in the news, but it always comes back. Next, it's not just the focus of controversy. It's the focus of rage and fury and anger and hatred all around the world. Well, that goes with what the Bible says. The Bible says that in the end, all the nations are going to come against this little tiny nation of Israel. It would sound impossible, except you can see it coming. I mean, think about this. You know, the United Nations has condemned Israel more than any other nation all nations combined together, one little nation. Well, that's what the Bible says in the end. It's all, they're all going to come to Israel. And all these things are signs the Bible has given for one other thing. You see, if the Jewish people had come back, they've come back to the land of Israel. That means someone else is coming back to the land of Israel. The king is coming. If Israel's back, then the king of Israel has got to come back. And so it's a sign of the coming of Messiah. Messiah said, I'm not going to come again until you, my ancient people, you say, Baruch haba, Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And that day is coming. And you know, it says that day is going to come when, when Israel is at war, when all nations are against it, when it's in crisis, that they're going to come and turn to him because in that day, Messiah, who's also, his name is Yeshua or Jesus, is going to fight for his people. And they will said they will look upon me whom they have pierced and turn to him in that day. Well, it's coming. And you see another sign is actually that Jewish people are actually coming to Messiah now as Jewish believers. That's a sign. I'm a sign. There's other signs all over the world because it's coming. And you know something else? 
generations of believers have looked and longed for and hoped for in past ages, past centuries, that they could see what God said, that they would see the fulfillment of this, of the Jewish people returning to their land and Israel becoming a nation in the world again. Well, they couldn't see it, but you can. You see, God has chosen you. If you're born again right now, God has chosen you not only to be born again, but to be living in the day when God is fulfilling his word to his ancient people. You are chosen for this. And think about that. That that means, you know, we just think about it as a prophecy thing, but it's a relationship thing too, because if you're in the world, you're a believer who's in the world when Israel's come back, that means you're relating to Israel in some way. You're, You're alive and Israel's alive. And so there's a charge, there's a responsibility. It says, comfort, comfort ye my people, says the Lord. Speak kindly to Jerusalem. It is for us to bless Israel. It's a charge to stand with Israel when the whole world's against Israel to stand. You know, it's a sign If the world's against Israel, it's against you too as a believer. And so we got to stand. And so it's a charge to stand for Israel. This is the hour that we can actually do it. It's a privilege. You see, to share and shine the love of Messiah because you have their Messiah in your heart and, and they gave it to you. It's time to bless back and to bless Israel is to fulfill this great commission, the final part. Because when they come, then he's coming. And when they come, it'll be life from death. When they come, that's when the lion will lay down with a calf and the wolf with a lamb and they'll beat their swords into plowshares and the knowledge of the Lord will fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. Let's be part of that and bless. God bless you. Shalom. Today, we've been talking about the importance of believers standing with Israel and why that matters. And our next guest has been a bold vocal supporter of Israel and a strong champion of standing on the word of God. So Dr. Robert Jeffress, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. We just wanna thank you again for joining us. We know this is a topic you are passionate about. You've got a new book coming out on this subject of the question I'm about to ask you, what is Israel's future according to the Bible? And how does it point to Israel's victory in this current war? Well, very simply put, Israel's uh, place in the end times is gonna be one of victory. God has given to Israel something that he's given to no other nation, and that is the promise of endurance. There's no promise that the United States is gonna survive forever, but God said my nation of Israel is going to survive forever. And so that means victory in the end. Thank you so much for sharing with us from your years of wisdom and experience. You know, there's nothing more vital right now than for the church to take a stand and let Israel and the Jewish people know that they're not alone and they have not been forgotten. Here with a message on why we stand with Israel, Dr. Robert Jeffress. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be with you. You know, I'm asked many times by Christians and non-Christians, what's the big deal with Israel? Why do you Christians always stand with Israel? And I'm gonna answer that question in the few minutes we have together today. If you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 12. You know, the Bible can be divided into two parts. Genesis 1 through 11 is part one. It's about man's alienation from God, man moving further and further away from God. But beginning with Genesis 12 all the way through Revelation 22, we have the story of God's reconciliation with man. And it all started in Genesis chapter 12 with a man named Abraham. When Abraham was 75 years old, God made this promise to Abraham. The Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. This is what we call the Abrahamic covenant. God said to Abraham, Abraham, first of all, I'm going to send you to a land. I'm going to give you a land. And in Genesis 15, he outlined what that land would be for Abraham and his descendants through Isaac. Israel's not in all the land yet, but this was the land that would belong to them forever. And not only that, he said in verse two, and I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great so that you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. 
He said, secondly, Abraham, in addition to a land, I'm going to make you a strong nation, a nation that will endure forever. And finally, he said, and through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. This was a promise of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, where do you get that in this verse? Well, in Galatians 3 in the New Testament, Paul said that Christ was the fulfillment of this promise. Now, what I want you to see is God promised to Abraham and his descendants a land, a nation, and a blessing. And notice three things about this covenant God made with Abraham. First of all, it was a literal promise. The land God had in mind was not heaven. A lot of people think, oh, Abraham was headed to heaven. No, he packed up his family and he started heading to that literal land here on earth that God had promised him. Yes, it's true. Ultimately, Abraham was also looking for a new Jerusalem whose builder and architect is God, but he was looking for a literal land, a land that we now know as Israel. The promise was literal. Secondly, the promise was eternal. He said, Abraham, I'm going to give this land to you forever. Genesis 13, verse 25. You know, forever is a long time. Just to give you an idea of how long it is, imagine a bird that comes once every thousand years to sharpen its beak on the top of Mount Everest. It sharpens its beak and then it flies away for a thousand years. It comes back to sharpen its beak again. By the time that bird has worn down completely Mount Everest, eternity will have only just begun. God said, I'm gonna give you this land forever. And thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, this promise was not only literal and eternal, it was unconditional. There are many people, perhaps some watching this broadcast, who erroneously think that because Israel rejected Jesus Christ, God broke his covenant with Israel and transferred it to the church. No, such a thing is impossible. This was an unconditional promise God made to Abraham and his descendants. In Psalm 89, God said very clearly, if my people break my laws, I will punish their transgressions. Yes, but I, Psalm 89, 33, I will not break off my loving kindness from Israel or deal falsely in my faithfulness. My covenant I will not violate, nor will I alter it with my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. God said, Abraham, this is an unconditional promise. And to signify that, God did something very interesting. In Abraham's day, now get this, in Abraham's day, if two kings were going to make a bilateral agreement, they would make the agreement and then to signify it, they would take some animals, kill the animals, slice them in two and put the pieces of the animal on the opposite sides, creating a path between the animal pieces. And then the two kings would walk side by side in the midst of those animal pieces, each one carrying a torch, signifying that each one had a responsibility to keep his end of the bargain. But when God wanted to ratify this promise with Abraham, he did something very unusual. In Genesis 15, God said to Abraham, slice those animals in two and place them in their proper place. And so Abraham did that. And then Genesis 15 says, God put Abraham to sleep. And God himself walked through those animal pieces, signifying that God's promise to Abraham was unconditional. It did not depend on what Abraham and his descendants did or didn't do. God said, this covenant I will keep with you and believing Israel. In Hebrews 6, God, God's word says that since God couldn't swear by any other greater name, he swore by himself when he made this promise to Abraham. This is an unconditional promise. Now, some of you may be saying, well, Pastor Jeffers, that's wonderful. That's great news for Israel. But what about me? I'm a Gentile. Why should I care about some covenant God made with Abraham 4,000 years ago? Why should I care whether he keeps his covenant or not? 
Well, first of all, we are the beneficiaries as Gentiles of the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant. We've been blessed by Jesus Christ, the son of David, who came and died and rose again, that we might have eternal life. But even more important than that is God's willingness to keep this covenant is a test of his faithfulness. He says, I've made a promise and I will not alter that promise. We should care about that. Let me illustrate why. We have been told by God's word that if we will place our faith in Christ, we are saved forever and that nothing will change our status before God. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. In John 10, 28, Jesus made the promise, I give eternal life to them and they shall never perish and no man shall snatch out of my hands those whom the Father has given me. Now, just suppose after trusting in Christ as your Savior, you die and you stand before God. And God says, you know, I told you, you would be saved through grace by trusting in my Son. But I've decided to change the terms of the deal. And instead of saving you by grace, I'm going to try to save you by your works if you have enough good ones. So let's look at the record. Oh, no, you did that. You did that. You did that. No, I'm not going to let you into heaven. How do we know God is going to keep his promise to us? Because Romans 11:29 says, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. God cannot break his covenant to us and he cannot break his covenant to Israel. God has made an unconditional promise to believing Israel and he's going to keep that promise just as he has made an unconditional promise to you and me. And because he's going to keep his promise to Israel, we can know he's going to keep his promise to us. That's why we care about Israel and God's faithfulness, his unconditional faithfulness to Israel. I don't think it's an accident you've tuned into this broadcast today. Israel is an object lesson of God's love and his faithfulness. Have you placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? What we see happening in Israel right now, I believe is a sign that we are moving closer and closer and closer to the end times when Christ will return for those who know him. And if you have never trusted in Jesus as your savior, I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. Would you bow your heads with me wherever you are and pray this simple prayer in your heart if you would like to know Christ as your Savior. Just pray this with me. Dear God, thank you for loving me. I know I have failed you in so many ways and I'm truly sorry for the sins in my life. But I believe what I've heard today that you loved me so much you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for me, to take the punishment I deserve to take for my sins. And right now, I'm trusting in Jesus, not in my good works, but in Jesus alone to save me from my sins. Thank you for forgiving me and help me to live the rest of my life for you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you and thank you for watching.